spirit did not just come out of thin air. It took many conversations, getting to know each of the artists' artworks, all of the themes, and really reflecting on the history and the meaning of hip hop today. All of this was beautifully managed by Mr. Dayton Schroeder. Oh, so there's a couple of driving elements, you know, um, I think philosophically as a designer, as a black designer, for me, um, I felt that it was important to start whenever possible from a place of, of creating opportunities for um, reconciling cultural memory loss. I think as black Americans, one of, one of our legacies is that we were robbed of our name, language, history and culture. And so I always relish at the opportunity to always be able to, to, to use, use our culture and, and use these opportunities as ways to, to, to fill that void. The black that you see, you know, the black that's chosen as a backdrop in the in exhibit is, is essentially a representation of that void, of that absence of memory. Um, but it's also simultaneously a, a, a representation of the potential, the future potential of, of hip hop above and beyond even this this 50 year mark and and and, and represents what hip hop and, and and the culture itself can evolve it can evolve to and become you know in the future are you satisfied with the outcome i'm very satisfied i think um you know this this experience um like like any experience um that e that evolves living living cultures was was improvisational. It was it was collaborative. You know, we worked we worked in close cl collaboration with the curatorial team here at the BMA, and um, it, it was it was as much again a, a learning project and a, and, a, and a sort of revelational process as as we go through and, and, and really you know taught us a lot about um, um, you know the 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 art. I think the art itself um, we, we can't we can't. You know, removed from this conversation, I think the art in and of itself was, is is really the, um, the the cream of this of this of this exhibit. And, and in many ways, um, you know, we had to be very um, we had to exercise a level of restraint, you know, to ensure that the the the, the backdrop and the, the infrastructure that we provided didn't overshadow the art, that the art remained prominent. But at the same time, you know, providing that, that, that curatorial infrastructure um, to enlighten and bring awareness to the art objects so that the, the, you know, the visitor can really understand and appreciate the art within its proper context. The climate today in America, the black and white hostilities that are floating from the politics to the general population, did that affect the way you went about architecturally doing this? Again, I think... Um, because as an artist, you know, you, you yeah. know, the climate has a lot to do with how you I think, prepare something. I think that we are in a... We're in a renaissance period. Um, I think when you look back and in contemporary history, um, particularly around black cultural identity, um, you'll find, you'll, I think 19, the 1930s will stand out, right? I think that was definitely a, a renaissance in and of itself that was really focused on, that was the first time that black Americans were able to really focus on their own identity and, and craft an understanding, a philosophical understanding of, of who they were um, and, and begin to ask fundamental questions about black art, black aesthetic values and the like. I think fast forward, the 1960s is probably another moment where you, you might consider a, a renaissance. I think what's key about that moment, it, it's a, it was a moment of political agitation. It was a moment at which, um, you know, black Americans were threatening the power structure, you know, for, 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 for you know, for, for a, an opportunity to play, to, to, to treat us fairly. Um, to, to, be, to, to be integrated, to be, to be part of this, this society. And I, and I think the difference, I think, as I said, I think this is definitely another renaissance moment, but I think the difference between now and the 1960s is that 
we we have now established some critical mass. We we have some we've we've allowed we 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 have had some gains in getting access to, to positions of power, and so for the first time, we are agitating from the inside out, if you will. We're no, we're no longer agitating outside. externally. We're finally. You know, we finally have the power of access and authority to be able to use the resources, tools, and power of the of the power structure itself to advocate for ourselves. Well, congratulations. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. I learned something today. That these Travis Scott Nike's <laughs> influence a piece of work by Julie Meratu, and that piece of work is this. It's at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Phenomenal. Um, this one was inspired by the outfit. The so purple was inspired by the outfit that Kim Wood wore at the MTV Awards. The turquoise Chanel wig was inspired by Little Kim and her love for designer, the, the uh, designer collections, as well as the Versace, that was inspired by Little Kim and her love for fashion designers. And the zipper wig was inspired by a stylist uh, out of Europe in um, the early 2000s that I actually followed and through magazines, and I just recreated something I saw there. So you are a, a hip hop artist. I am a hip hop artist. Yes. Okay. And from here in Baltimore. I am from Maryland. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm from the closer part of DC than um, Baltimore. Okay. But I claim Baltimore as well. So besides the here, what else did you do with the hip hop? With the hip hop. Um, I feel like I breathe life into the hip-hop culture through yeah. hair. Mm -hmm. So inspiring them through their looks and, then, and giving them, uh, pushing them over the edge a little bit outside of their comfort zone in hip-hop. Have you been doing this from youth up? Or? Oh, yeah. I've been doing hair since I started cutting hair at 14. Mm -hmm. My mom had three beauty salons in Maryland, mm -hmm. so I grew up in the salon as a little girl. Yeah. What made you gravitate to the hip-hop? I actually just gravitated to New York wanting to do entertainers, a desire to do entertainers, mm -hmm. and hip-hop was an emerging uh, genre of music, and uh, I, would, I would say that the generation kind of changed right at that mark, it was a generational shift, mm -hmm. so I kind of got in on that generational shift, there was a lot younger executives, a lot younger um, artists taking control over their career. Is it the creative aspect of it that got you into it? It wasn't so much the creative aspect, because everything was just natural and organic. We weren't thinking, we were just doing Really? Yeah. Wow. We were just doing it and, and, and expressing ourselves through art at the moment. So now it's 50 years old. What well, it's not, this is not 50 not, years not old. Not this, but the hip hop <laughs> culture. Yes. <laughs> I know. How do you feel? Honored. Um, I really don't have words to describe it, especially experiencing this exhibit. That, it's yeah, very man. overwhelming. Yes. And if you would have asked me would I've ever thought this would happen, no, when I was creating these wigs, did I think that this would happen? Not at all. So I'm very honored, very grateful, and um, it's, it's a real experience. I love it. What's next for you? Inspiring young artists to follow their dreams. Are you going to have a line of wigs? created That's for yourself? Thought. That's a thought. They would uh, they would be specialty wigs. Yes. They would be event wigs. I would do specialty work when it comes to designing wigs. So it's a so big market out here. So many wigs already out here. If mine's not special, then what's the point, right? Yeah. Oh, there it is. But I'm sure that you have certain qualities that you look for in Oh, it's going to be top of the line. Top yeah. of the line construction, top of the line hair. I will source all of my materials, all raw materials, and they will be made here, here in America, made oh. in the U.S. Oh, I won't do it. Look forward to seeing you again. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, great to meet you. Radio uh, tires. You can see the access to the, the, the backs of the shoes, just the, the, right in the insole, are done in uh, the airbags. The tires, even the laces themselves. If you look closely, you'll see that they're seat belts. And so, this is a work that um, he's been conceiving of for some time. I think in its, in its original conception, he wanted to see it on hydraulics. So he's thinking very much both about the shoe, but also about car culture. 
and thinking about how the shoe and the car culture come together in this work. And he has painted these custom drop cloths for this particular installation. And on a very sunny day, when the sky is very blue, the shoes are meant to kind of disappear up into the heavens, uh, which they do rather gloriously. One other thing I wanted to say, because St. Louis is still in the house. St. Louis is still in the house. <laughs> Eric Fowler is from St. Louis, and he made sure to have Missouri tags on one of the Air Force Ones. <laughs> This is a symbol of our beautiful partnership that we have with the St. Louis Art Museum. We could not be here without their incredible support and collegiality. And Aaron Fowler, we are in his debt. To create this out of a Monte Carlo, which is what he started with, it's hard to imagine. But that's what we're trying to say about hip hop. It's making do with what is on hand and creating beauty that astonishes. We hope that you enjoy it.